Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to Geriatric Medicine Grand Rounds. Glad you could join us. Um, we have our third of four geriatric medicine fellows um, presenting her Grand Rounds today, Dr. Kim Vu. Um, each of the fellows gets to pick the topic that they want to present on and um, Kim will tell you why she chose this topic. Um, um, and it's going to be a great presentation. I heard an earlier version of this and it's really great. So I'm excited that you're bringing this to us and take it away, Kim. Great. Oh, oh, oh wait, before you take it away, I'm so sorry. Just a reminder for all the Jerry faculty and fellows, um, you, some of you have a, uh, an Outlook invite for a meeting right after this for our annual program evaluation. So look in your um, email in your calendars. It's a separate Zoom link and we'll start that at um, nine o'clock. All right, go ahead, Kim. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to my uh, grand grounds this morning. I'm very excited to talk about and talk on dysphagia, um, just in general understanding it, but hopefully we can turn up some conversation about how we can make decisions based on patient-centered care. Um, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I know um, Kate's heard and a few others of you have heard. I mean, just personally and in dealing with dysphagia cases, I feel like as much as I continue to um, be exposed to different problems and patients that you know undergo the challenge of having dysphagia, I think it continues to be a hard topic um, for patients and their families to make decisions about. Um, and I continue to learn in this area um, because it's so important and we continue um, to learn and try to figure out new things and, and better ways to take care of dysphagia. Um, so good morning and thank you for being here. Happy Friday. Okay, so uh, my learning goals for this presentation is to just generally talk about the epidemiology and impact that dysphagia has on the U.S. population, to talk about the types and causes of dysphagia, um, the many ways that we can evaluate them, everything from super conservative, quick, easy, to more of the procedural ways of evaluating for it and diagnosing for it, um, to go over the different options of management, um, how they're different, how they're applicable or not really feasible for certain patients, and then to end with uh, hopefully some discussion on patient-centered care, how we can um, go about helping patients and their families make those types of dis decisions based on their values and supporting them through that. Okay, so it's not a talk about dysphagia if we don't talk about just the general mechanism of swallowing. It's always important to just acknowledge that it's just a very complex process. And I mean, I think you can probably do a whole presentation on how this works and all the nerves and muscles and things involved. But just generally for us, we can think about swallowing in three different phases. Um, and we can start with, you know, the first phase being the oral phase where the food comes into the oral cavity. Um, and in this realm, of course, there's chewing involved. There's already starting breakdown of um, you know, solids and liquids in that um, area of anatomy. Um, and then the bolus of food will travel down and will begin the pharyngeal phase where you have here the epiglottis coming down, um, blocking your airway, and then this upper esophageal sphincter opening up, whereas it was closed earlier to allow for the next phase here. Um, and so then we have, this is a second phase. And then in the third phase, of course, the bolus should be um, traveling through um, the esophagus. And you know, as the food travels down, there should be peristalsis for the food to make it down into your stomach. Okay, so um, to add about swallowing, so there are some normal changes that come with the swallowing mechanism with age. That's not to say that dysphagia is something that happens with age. I think a really big and important part of being a geriatrician is, you know, teasing out what's normal aging and what's not, especially when patients are concerned. I know I, I tend to more to get this kind of question, like, is, I think this is normal aging or oh, I'm, this is just part of being old. For other topics, maybe not necessarily for this, but it's good to understand that with age, 
you know, your tongue to start just, I started going from, you know, the front of the mouth all the way back down um, in terms of the swan mechanism that the tongue does have some atrophy and weakness and that can um, be important for um, just the, the mechanical process of chewing and, and eating food. Um, the pharynx it, itself, as we travel down, has reduced sensation, increased dilation and weakness. And then we encounter the vocal cords that can have reduced sensation as well. The upper esophageal sphincter I pointed out earlier can actually have a reduced opening with age and that can be problematic for dysphagia would not necessarily cause and be part of normal aging, right? So it, it can be reduced. And then you have um, the esophagus itself being stiffer and having reduced sensation. So overall, just understanding that the muscles can be weaker. They have less sensation. That's normal, but dysphagia itself is not normal. Um, so just, you know, what is dysphagia really? I think um, it's interesting because dysphagia is really a subjective um, thing that patients can endorse to us. So it's just them saying like, it's difficult for me to swallow. I have a hard time swallowing things. Um, aspiration is what we're, we're actually worried about. Aspiration is the actual part that the, the solids and liquids go down the wrong pipe. Okay, so just to differentiate that dysphagia, there's nothing really objective about saying, you know, I have dysphagia. It's really um, something that the patient endorses. Um, so very important topic. So in the community, the percentages from what I've seen can vary for patients who have or dysphagia from 15 to 22%. And um, the studies that I read said that, you know, for the participants in those studies, over half of them haven't really discussed it with their primary care providers. So it's really important for us just to ask if they have any problems with swallowing, um, just to nip it in the bud, figure things out earlier on. Um, and of course the, the prevalence in skilled nursing facilities is even greater than that. The incidence is about 25 supposedly per 100,000 a year, that to me sounds a little bit lower, but that's the number that I found. And of course, the risk um, of having, or the incidence of having dysphagia increases with age, particularly after the age of 70. Anyone that has dysphagia um, is at risk of having poor outcomes, generally in terms of um, malnutrition, social isolation, dehydration, um, weight loss, and then of course for aspiration pneumonia, which I'll get into for many reasons relating to the dysphagia, but importantly for what we see, you know, acutely as a result of dysphagia and aspiration is that patients can develop pneumonia and um, there's a really high mortality rate once somebody develops community acquired pneumonia, um, the mortality rate can be as high as around 20-ish percent. So overall, dysphagia con contributes to morbidity and as well as hospital length of stay and mortality. So a very important topic. So I wanted to include one example patient um, just to think about now, and then we'll go over everything that I talked about in terms of learning points, and I'll come back to this patient to, to go over thoughts on this case. Um, so 74-year-old man with Alzheimer's dementia and chronic dysphagia, is a history of aspiration pneumonia already, presents with a urinary tract infection, hypovolemia and hypernatremia. He has been taking thickened liquids at home for the past several months, and um, he's improving now that he's getting IV fluids and antibiotics for his UTI, and he's requesting to drink thin liquids. So you think about a, a little bit about, you know, how he's had the chronic dysphagia, you know, he's had some things happened to him, now he's in the hospital and he wants to drink some thin liquid. So um, what do we do in these kinds of situations to think about? So just in talking about the types of dysphagia um, in organizing them, you can organize them anatomically. So the first portion of the anatomy that I brought up earlier in the oral pharyngeal um, area of the anatomy versus the esophageal area in both of those um, types of dysphagia that you can describe. Each of those can have structural or propulsive problems. Structural um, problems being obstructive, they're typically, not always, but they can typically um, be with just problems with swallowing solids alone. A lot of these things are kind of 
mechanical in the sense that it can literally be something blocking um, that part of the swallowing mechanism, whether it's like an abscess or a diverticulum, some type of malignancy. Um, sometimes strictures um, can can lead to structural problems and dysphagia. So that's something to consider and, and something to think about in regards to having patients with um, untreated GERD. I know we, we have a lot of um, conversations as geriatricians about chronic use of PPIs and whether or not it's appropriate or not and weighing my risk and benefits. And so this is something definitely to consider in, in preventing problems with dysphagia, but then also being on a chronic PPI. Um, in terms of the propulsive um, types of problems within the types of dysphagia, um, they're often, this is where your neurological problems can be or, or diagnoses. So things such as stroke or neurodegenerative diseases like dementia, um, like neuromuscular disorder, scleroderma, tardive dyskinesia. Um, so these tend to be the more progressive types that we can um, describe and categorize dysphagia. So just in general about um, getting a patient history, touching upon it, you know, if, if they do endorse and say they have problems with swallowing, you know, you, you ask the things like, you know, how often, what gets stuck, what happens when you swallow? You can ask about other symptoms that they may be having alongside to see if there's other contributors. So um, red flags or things you might look for um, are like the weight loss, right, for malignancy. And then for dyspepsia or heartburn, they might have some like chronic GERD problems that can be treated and dealt with. And then um, contributing medications as well. And then asthma or allergy um, contributors. So what are other signs and symptoms? I, I brought up a couple other ones in the last slide um, where I mentioned the heartburn, um, but you know the, the sensation of having food get stuck. Um, if they've ever felt that they've aspirated before, I think if people do complain about it, they probably have this symptom um, pretty commonly where they feel like they're choking on something. Um, and so that's where they do, they might endorse to you aspiration and a lot of coughing. Sometimes when um, patients describe coughing, that's you know a sign that maybe this should be evaluated further. And I mentioned um, weight changes as well. Um, so in terms of ways to evaluate for dysphagia, um, I spoke earlier on just conservative versus more procedural ways. This is probably the most conservative way of evaluating for, evaluating for someone's swallow mechanism. Um, I bring this one up and um, interestingly, I was at last, was this last week? Yes, it was. The um, California Academic Geriatric Institutions Conference in California. It was the inaugural one, so you might not have heard of it, um, but there was a good poster about um, bedside evaluations in the hospital and how you know sometimes we rely on nursing staff to do that because we wanna just be able to get uh, a diet order in. And, you know, in terms of patient complaints, um, I said that statistic earlier about how um, over 50% of patients out in the community don't really talk to primary care providers about problems with dysphagia, but in the hospital, when they show up, they will complain about one pain and two, when can I eat something? Can I eat something, please? And so um, this is a simple way of evaluating for um, swallow. Um, one of the most standardized ways of evaluating for someone's swallow mechanism is a modified barium swallow study. Um, if that's on its own, sometimes that's done just in images. But if you do an order for a video fluoroscopic swallow study, then it, it records a whole segment of someone swallowing through different barium consistencies. So the pros of this is that it's very standardized. Um, you can look at the mechanism of dysphagia. I'll show in the next slide different findings that you can get from this kind of study. However, something to think about is it can be pricey, time consuming. Our patients do get exposed to radiation. And then there's the wonder of, you know, is this translatable or is what we're testing translatable to a patient's ability to safely eat and, and drink? And that's not really proven per se, because if you can imagine um, this is a very standardized test with barium consistencies. It's not exactly the things they're eating and drinking. Um, and so the studies have shown that the, the translation of, okay, 
um, we have these findings, we'll recommend this, but it, and many, many studies have shown that the recommendations that come from them don't exactly lead to what we may be setting in terms of goals for someone's dysphagia. So something to really think about. Um, so as I mentioned, um, in terms of a swallow study, so this is an example of the, of the patient that I've taken care of in the hospital and just a screenshot of part of his uh, VFSS or a video swallow study. Um, and they were able to find all these things about it. And I mentioned at the beginning, um, swallow mechanism can be very, very complicated. And so they were able to find that he has increased pharyngeal residue. There is absent epiglottic inversion. So that, that safety of having your epiglottis come down and cover your airway, it was absent in this patient. He had reduced stripping waves. So the ability of food to come down the esophagus um, was reduced. There was reduced hyolaryngeal high, high excursion. So that's one of the muscles that's heavily involved in the swallowing mechanism. He really needed multiple swallows um, per teaspoon that were, that were ineffective in trying to clear things up when he did have problems with it. Um, he had a weak cough. And then I mentioned that that upper esophageal sphincter um, is, is reduced and that's very common in older age. Another um, study that can be done is a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swelling or a FEES study. Um, this is one that can actually be done bedside. And so, um, you know, this is where, and I, I've seen it in ENT offices where they take the endoscope and it, it goes through a patient's nose, passes into the throat, and that way you can really visualize and look at the anatomy of, say, like the vocal cords, look for any like uh, anomalies in, in that sense. And so, um, I've seen sometimes it can take long to be uncomfortable for patients, but I've seen them be pretty quick in a good way of visualizing and really looking at those structures that can be involved in dysphagia. Um, here's an EGD. Um, we all know about EGDs and often we'll, we'll look at EGDs for things like concern for bleeding and, and all of that, but we can also use it to help evaluate for dysphagia. Um, it is performed under conscious sedation. So if that's a concern, giving someone some sedation um, can put, especially our older adults at higher risk uh, for things happening to them. And so um, we ha really have to consider what we are trying to get out of an EGD. They can perform biopsies and dilations if, if a stricture or some kind of uh, mechanical problem is, uh, there's a concern for that. Um, and then you can also measure for manometry. Um, and so in this case, there's a catheter put through the nose and into the stomach, and then you're able to, to measure the pressure as someone is swallowing sips of water. So just another um, study, especially if you're, you're thinking of strictures um, and, and problems of that sort. I just think of whenever I see anything through the nose like this one in the fees study that um, I'm told by nurses and patients that it's just the most uncomfortable thing in the world to put things down their nose. So just always consider that if, if this is a study that we're considering. Um, and then, so starting with forms of management, um, I think I started with the simplest one to talk about, but um, I'll get into the categories of different things to do for dysphagia. But if there's, you know, some kind of mechanical blockage obstru obstruction or structural problem um, that is um, causing the dysphagia, we can consider things like excision, stenting, chemotherapy. These are all... Um, you know, soundingly potentially uh, treatment forms with some risk to them. It really depends on the situation, but it is more of what I would consider a concrete way of treating the problem or cause or etiology of the dysphagia. Um, so there's that in terms of treatment. Um, but uh, we also think in terms of when you think of swallow problems, you can put them into lump categories of compensation and rehabilitation. So what does compensation for dysphagia problems uh, mean? It means you can modify their diet, um, you know, after doing a study, especially with uh, a speech therapist or with the barium swallow, there can be recommendations for modifications of food and liquids. And I'll get into what that might look like in a later slide. Um, you can talk about or consider um, practices that are pretty benign and, and you know, when I hear and think of benign ways of managing problems with dysphagia, I think this is a really good one to just suggest to any patient, I think, 
there's no problem with saying, you know, when you're swallowing, um, do a chin tuck and take small bites or sips. Um, the studies do show that um, those who do chin tucking um, do decrease signs of aspirations in a third of patients or participants in the study. And one of the studies I did look at, you know, overall, um, the goal is to minimize risk for aspiration. But what I'll get into with these studies is that when you modify the diet, the goal is to minimize this risk, but these modified diets can actually cause harms of their own. So there are studies that show that those with um, thickened liquids, if, if you're prescribing or ordering a diet that involves some form of a thickened liquid, patients can actually become dehydrated, have fevers, UTIs, and quality of life, like the patient I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation. Um, some of the things that lend to this, if you can imagine, are if you're getting prescribed a thick and liquid diet, you're not actually getting more fluid into your system. You actually will need more of it to compensate, and, and that can dehydrate somebody. It's, it doesn't have that much of that thin fluid um, or as much fluid into the body or, or water um, content um, as normal. And so um, those are the, some of the things that lend to that study. There was another study that showed that um, in stroke patients, when there were these diet modifications, it did decrease the risk of pneumonia in the first seven days of having these diet modifications, but those, um, but that decrease in risk really plateaued. And you know, after the seven days, the, the risk reduction didn't really um, persist. And then oppositely, when continuing with thin liquids, so if you didn't put in that kind of diet modification for whatever reason, um, if you just continued with thin liquids, it didn't, it didn't, it did the opposite and it didn't increase the risk for pneumonia as it would if you were to do um, the modified diets. And it, and it did not increase the risk for dehydration, malnutrition, or death. People were able to just continue on um, and the opposite findings were there. So interestingly. Um, so just to get into, I was mentioning what it looks like with these, oh, it's got a commercial, I'm sorry, thought I played through it earlier. Okay, so I wanted to show you all here because it's best seen in a video. I, I try not to do too many videos and presentations, but when you're talking about consistencies, I think it's best to see them. Um, so this is a, a video talking about the different uh, fluid consistencies. And, and they're not categorized as they are now. Patients who have oral motor weakness or poor coordination may require a thickened liquid consistency to slow the movement of liquid and allow ample time for the swallowing process to occur. There are four levels of liquid consistencies. Thin liquids. Thin liquids are considered to be the least restrictive. Examples of thin liquids are water, tea, and coffee. Other examples include ice cream, milkshakes, sherbet, and jello. The broth in soups and the milk served with cereal are both thin liquids. Nectar thick liquids. Nectar thick liquids should pour in a continuous stream without breaking into drops. Examples include fruit nectars, maple syrup, eggnog, tomato juice, buttermilk, and cream based soups. It's important to note that carbonated beverages are not considered to be a nectar-thick consistency. Honey-thick liquids. These liquids are thickened to a honey-like consistency. It pours very slowly from a spoon and sticks to the sides of the cup. Pudding-thick liquids. Pudding-thick liquids are considered to be the most restrictive. Pudding-thick liquids will hold a shape when scooped into a spoon. Pre-thickened liquids may be obtained in bulk or packaged in individual containers. Pre-thickened liquids are preferable as the taste is often better and there is no room for error when determining if the liquid is thickened to the correct consistency. Some liquids, however, may need to be thickened as needed. This can be completed with products such as Thick and Easy, Thick It Up, Thick It, or Simply Thick. To properly thicken a liquid, please refer to the instructions on the thickener package that you're using. 
it is important to strictly follow the instructions as each thickener has its own directions and protocol. Okay, I'm just gonna stop it there because I really wanted to show it just because of the consistency that are different between. Um, but back to noting that um, the different levels of fluid consistencies has changed and I'll show that in a couple slides. Okay, in terms of uh, food consistencies, again, this is not inclusive of all the different levels, but I just wanted to show, um, because I think pictures tell more than what I say about if things are soft versus mechanical or minced and moist. And it's always funny hearing those words and not seeing what that looks like. And it's important to realize and recognize for our patients. When we order something that's minced and moist or something like that, and um, patients don't like the idea of it. And it's so important if we're trying to give them nutrients that we consider, you know, if we're going to order this, are they even going to want to eat it? Um, and so just questions for quality of life, right? Okay. So this is actually um, the more updated um, framework for how solids and liquids are categorized um, now. Before it was really a a, a questionable thing for, for some foods and, and there were barriers to how they were categorized before. So just going into the consistencies for solids. So for example, um, seven's regular, regular is regular. Um, five and six um, together, what was the order that used to be considered mechanical soft. And so now that's been teased apart and now you have soft and bite-sized which includes things like um, boiled vegetables and pancakes, cake. Um, you have your minced and moist. So that can be things like ground beef. Um, and then of course, or you get into pureed things and we know what pureed things are. Um, and then you'll see that of course, there's, there's overlap between um, solids or foods that are pureed or liquidized or, or thinned down to where it would match some of the liquid consistencies. Um, because of they're thin in terms of a solid, but then thick in terms of a liquid. Um, so they make that connection and really standardize that. So going into the fluids for um, being extremely thick, that's uh, consistent with parade, uh, kind of like what we're looking at with the um, pudding consistently see in that video earlier. Um, for two and three, the mild and moderately thick that used to be what was considered honey thick and was mentioned in that video too, That's that was honey thick and now that's teased apart. Um, and then you have a slightly thick, which is what um, is considered nectar thick. And it's really nice that they um, differentiated zero and one with thin and slightly thick because that is that allows a slightly thick order allows for someone to take inshore because back before these categories were put or were put together like this framework, um, patients who weren't allowed thin liquids weren't allowed inshores either. And that's really problematic, right? When someone's trying to get their protein and nutrients in. Um, so that's the new and updated framework. So um, I mentioned earlier, we talked about the compensatory ways of, of managing dysphagia. These are the rehab ways. These are the ways um, that we can manage dysphagia um, according to things that can be recommended by speech therapy for exercises, targeting phys physiological impairment. Um, we can then focus on strength and skills. The one thing that I wasn't able to find, and maybe someone in the audience, if they were, they knew, you know, is when to reassess, right? So if someone has dysphagia, we assess them with say a swallow study and we're gonna give them or prescribe them these kinds of swallow um, exercises, when can you really assess? And, and I've asked um, speech therapists before about this and I don't think they were able to give me a concrete answer. It's more of like a, we'll see how the patient does day by day because it really varies at how much someone is able to rehab um, and get their swallow mechanism back up to par. Um, so it's really hard when families say, okay, when, when can we retest? I really think I really want them to be able to eat or the patient really wants to be able to eat and they want to show that they can do that. Um, but how do you know that they've progressed enough or how much time do we give them um, to reassess and, and allow them to have a different kind of diet order maybe. 
Um, I have here just an example of one of the exercises um, that can be prescribed to patients to strengthen their muscles. So what I was saying about um, muscle atrophy and decreased sensitivity earlier, this is something um, in that realm in terms of what can be done and for re rehabilitation, for things that can be rehabbed, right? And um, what to, to note is that um, both compensatory and, and rehab management options for dysphagia, we have to consider, you know, are these viable options for patients? Because if we're, if we're working with a patient who has some cognitive impairment and we tell them, you know, I recommend these kinds of diet modifications, if they were to be, say they're okay with it, or if we recommend these rehab um, exercises, will they be able to carry them through? You know, we really have to consider that. Um, but yeah, I mean, in regards to doing rehab exercises, there, there has been systematic reviews that they do have a positive effect on dysphagia. It's just a matter of there, there weren't too many large studies. There's a lot of smaller ones out there um, that look at different characteristics um, for the participants in the studies, um, as well as different therapies that they use. There's not really um, a centralized exercise prescription per se. So it was really tough. I think overall, the um, analysis that I looked at said, you know, there's generally a positive thing for rehab and, and rehab being one of the things that's not very, doesn't really have negative consequences per se. It's really the, the difficulty in, in having a patient do them. Okay, and then we have the, the sometimes dicey topic of tube feeding. Um, so in managing dysphagia, there's no way of avoiding, not no way, but um, in some circumstances, there's no way of avoiding the topic of tube feeding, whether or not we bring it up, patients and their families can bring it up. Um, really important topic to think about um, in, in society, ethically, um, it can be appropriate for some, right? It can be appropriate for um, older adults who have cancers and things where they just, it's not a, a gradual um, life limiting neurodegenerative problem per se, as much as it is a mass and, and uh, not having the anatomy to swallow like they did before. Um, there's different forms of tube feeding, <clears throat> you know, NG tube, which I said is, is very uncomfortable for patients. And then you have um, G tubes. Um, and then um, you know, with these tubes, they each come with their own types of risks and comforts or discomforts, um, problems with dislodging, but you have to make sure that we note that when we consider the topic comes up about tube feeding, that we recognize for those patients that do have those progressive neurodegenerative conditions that they don't reduce um, aspiration events in regards to secretion. So I think, you know, especially when you present to family or, or family bring up, you know, they can't eat. Can we put, can we have a G tube placed? Can we have a feeding tube placed? Um, and it can be hard for them to understand that we're not, I mean, that food is one concern, but another concern is um, a patient's ability to safely clear their secretions. And I think we try to give them an idea of like the, the average person or a, a healthy person might be um, producing like two liters of secretions a day and that you have to consider them being able to swallow that, let alone food. It's, it's at that point, usually I think for us, we're not as concerned about food as much as we are about just clearing secretions. Um, and then there's even some studies um, that suggests that when you do place a G-tube that it can actually increase the risk of aspiration events despite thinking that, you know, we'll place this, this um, tube feeding to, to try to reduce those events. Um, we sometimes try to educate patients and their families that it doesn't improve the mortality for um, neurodegenerative conditions. That's what the studies show. Um, the studies also show that, um, especially in certain socioeconomic um, SES considerations there for elderly patients with dementia, there's higher incidence of um, tube placement if they're lower income, if they have Medicaid, if they're African-American. And so 
in what I was saying earlier about improving mortality and having patients and families want this, it's it can be a tough um, discussion to have. And I, I that's why towards the end of this presentation, I'll talk about how to have these discussions um, to kind of engage patients and their families and what they understand and to align with, with what their values are. Okay, so in terms of um, patient-centered care, um, I think Kate was alluding to this. I did attend AGS and there was a phenomenal talk about dysphagia and one of the biggest tools that they brought up um, for patient-centered care making decisions um, about things like feeding tubes or just dysphagia in general um, was this framework that they called swallows. I'm I'm one of the I am not a huge fan of different mnemonics and things. I never memorize them, but I think it's always clever to come up with. And then just to speak and say that um, this framework is really based off of the remap framework that's part of Vital Talk. Um, so it's really great um, in terms of dysphagia in this topic that I think geriatrics and palliative um, combine in, in trying to set the stage for a patient and, and to try to engage their understanding of why this, this dysphagia is there, if they understand um, what the etiology of it is. And then um, to say, you know, this is something that we have to talk about and consider and, and make decisions on and, and kind of engage in next steps. You allow for emotion. Um, that's where your nursing statements will come in and, and you try to support patients and their families and how they react to this being um, a problem, a really significant one. And it's really a time then to, to try to elicit what's important for, their, for patients and, and really spend a lot of time on the what matters piece um, to, to see is it important for them to, to taste food by mouth or is it not as important and they just want to be able to get nutrients? And I, and I know there's a bunch of studies about like, you know, starving and the idea of that, and we can get into it if we have time, um, but sometimes that is a really big cultural consideration that I wanted to bring up, especially what I was saying about SES earlier. I feel like um, a lot of times there's a lot of cultural considerations there for making those types of decisions. And then you leave them with options. Sometimes um, putting it out there like, okay, what do you want to do is kind of difficult. So you kind of get a sense for what's important to them and say what the options are for the current um, situation with the dysphagia um, and then see how they react to that. Welcome and answer any kinds of questions or concern and then align care with them and support that decision. So similar to remap, remap being um, reframing, expecting emotion, mapping, the future and then aligning with patients' values and then to set a plan. So it's very similar to remap, but here in the setting of um, dysphagia. Okay, so um, next in regards to patient-centered care, um, this is really important for all of us. It's just a reminder, I'm, I think I'm harping to the choir when it comes to the importance of filling out a pulse form um, but I also know, and sometimes I'm guilty of um, not necessarily getting to the backside for whatever reason, um, but it is there and we don't necessarily have to, um, you know, discuss it when a pulse form is filled out. Like the front part is obviously um, the most crucial and important part for code status and other things. Um, the artificial nutrition component of the pulse form um, course being extremely important but not as life and death and urgent as um, the the front part is and so it's it's important to if, if you can get to it to discuss it um, and if patients do have their preferences known it's important to document that um, should something ever happen to them and um, if they're not ready to make a decision it's at least something that gets brought up and that can be reviewed at an, another time. Um, yeah. All right, so just general recommendations into how to approach um, patients with problems with dysphagia. You know, it's a team-based approach. You really have to engage with 
um, patient nursing, involve your speech therapist, um, and then family or whatever the patient support system looks like. Um, I think most recently, um, I mean, I, as a budding ger a geriatrician, I think I'll continue to run into a lot of these types of situations, but, you know, sometimes we come along a lot of moral distress when it comes to um, patients and their families and decisions regarding uh, management of um, dysphagia, namely with feeding tubes or artificial nutrition, where it can be that maybe nursing feels that patient appears that they're suffering, but the patient and or their family wants to continue the, the feeding tube. So it's really important to, to support all members of, our team, of the team to um, address their concerns and, and try as much as we can to um, have an understanding of what the goals are for the patient or what the patient and their family have decided and, and go about that way. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, it's really important to try to prevent problems with dysphagia. There's some things that we cannot help um, in terms of problems with aging, but yeah, you know, dysphagia doesn't come with age. Some things change, but I know Lena did a great talk about oral hygiene and how that's important. And that really lends into um, causing some problems with, with dysphagia. So that's something that we can really keep on top of. I talked about treating GERD um, and then of course, going through medications that can lend to problems that eventually down the line cause dysphagia. Um, it's important for us to help inform patients, especially when we elicit if there are problems with dysphagia, what that may mean. Um, you know, talk earlier on about what the pros and cons or risks and benefits are of different management decisions. And so really to have the recommendation is to have these conversations early and with the entire team. Um, so getting back to my example patient. Um, so getting back to the 74 year old man with the dementia and the chronic dysphagia had the aspiration and the UTI um, had been doing thick and liquids. Um, his overall condition improved and he wants to drink thin liquids. Um, and this is where maybe that swallows framework can really come to play or remap come into play in terms of um, the pros and cons or risk benefit type of decisions. You know, if the patient has capacity or not, that's another question or whether we need to engage with his POA or next of kin um, in regards to, you know, questions about quality of life and, and preferences that the patient would have wanted. But to here consider you know, dysphagia being something very common, especially in a neurodegenerative condition and aspiration pneumonia not being surprising and the thickened liquids, you know, being something that the patient doesn't want. And so one of um, my most memorable patients is someone who just refused to do thickened coffee and said, I don't care. Um, I'm a hundred, he's a hundred, he's probably one of the first 100 year old people I've ever met um, that inspired me and when it comes to, you know, being able to make your own decisions. Um, so in overall summary, um, dysphagia, just highly, highly prevalent. We need to ask about it. We don't ask about it enough, I think, especially catching um, symptoms of it earlier on, like with coughing or with heartburn that can lend to dysphagia. Um, consider the different types of dysphagia, whether or not it's a, a structural or propulsive or obstructive and neurologic problem uh, or etiology for the dysphagia. Um, you can consider um, less or more invasive testing, just depending on what you elicit for goals of care, and then make decisions on compensatory versus rehab approaches to managing the dysphagia, whether it's appropriate or feasible for the patient. And these are my references. This is a photo of what I'm looking forward to baking very soon with the season change and all the berries ripening. I might even go this weekend. And of course, um, my pure evaluation. I think I saw um, some things in the chat. I don't wanna, I, I didn't want to cover the QR code. 
Are you able to find them, Kim? Or do you want uh, me to read or yeah. ask you to speak? Yes. I can read them. Thank you. Um, uh, that you hadn't heard about the two liter secretion data. Yeah, it's it's a good one to keep in mind because when we tell patients, yeah, our concern is actually the secretions and not necessarily the food. They think I don't think it's it's really good unless you give sort of that visual, like it's two liters, like it's a whole bottle of soda, whatever that you can um, put that visual into mind. Um, Kay mentioned I also I think also clarifying balancing risks of interventions um, and risk of aspiration if it should happen. Um, most definitely. It's so hard um, to have those com conversations about um, balancing those because I think the most common way I see it is that often patients and their families will say, okay, I'm either going to, actually this even came up recently on my palliative care rotation, I'm either going to potentially choke or I'm going to starve. And, you know, there's of course those, those studies that say towards end of life that patients don't really um, feel hunger, but it's so hard. And I, I don't know if anyone has a better way of saying that. Um, but that's what the study shows that like that sensation, especially towards the end of life is not really like there as much as other, um, symptoms and things that you may want to try to manage, um, in, in preference or priority. And then he also mentioned, I also think limiting options based on what their values and preferences versus giving them multiple to select from can be helpful. And I've seen that really uh, practice really well because I've seen, especially on palliative, you know, uh, and for age, um, the choosing wisely campaign um, recommendations is that when you have like a neurodegenerative condition, you don't really offer feeding tubes. That's not indicated. It's not something that's recommended to do whatsoever. But of course, if the patient and their family bring it up, we have to address it. But definitely it's it's not something that we should offer um, as an option. Okay, <laughs> great talk. I can really sink your teeth into this one. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, Tan Ong said, if I had this stage, I would accept the risk for that scone. Uh, I think Kay also put um, a journal article in there, uh, reconsidering the language of serious illness, which is great. I'm working on that all the time. It takes so much experience and I really commend our palliative colleagues in having these conversations with patients because I'm very, I find that I have a hard time because I talk very fast. And so I try to just slow down and make very concrete decisions on how I word things and try to be sensitive about um, patients and how they communicate. Um, so thank you. And if there's no other thing, I just wanted to note that this is a Marion Berry tart. This is an Italian plum cake from my neighbor who I, I had told her I love a la mode and she shared some of her homemade ice cream with me. Uh, this is homemade non-churn blackberry ice cream. And then these are my blueberry scones and I might go strawberry picking this weekend, we'll see. I wondered, Kim, after your year in the CLC and kind of focusing on a lot of the interdisciplinary teamwork, if you feel like there were particular questions that you asked of the speech therapist this year that really helped you better understand working with them or kind of if you had suggestions for me in thinking about uh, training next year's group of fellows to yeah. work with speech therapists and thinking about this topic a lot throughout a good portion of this year, um, if you had if you had words of wisdom to share. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I call them words of wisdom. I just have some um, experiences. I think uh, one of the speech therapists that we work with, she's phenomenal. And I think a lot of the things that we encounter in the CLC tend to be um, behavioral, I guess you, I would consider a categorize them in terms of um, what we're trying to manage um, for problems with dysphagia, because Sometimes I've had that instance where the patient will say, I have dysphagia. And the therapist says, well, you looks like you're safely swallowing and we can't meet that. And now we're trying to meet the patient's nutritional goals or recommendations, but they don't want to change their, um, they don't want to change their diet consistency, interestingly. So um, I think then it's a partnership IDT situation with maybe 
psychology in trying to navigate having that kind of conversation. So I think it's a great interdisciplinary way of approaching it, uh, maybe with the speech therapist as well as psychology. I guess that would be my tidbit. Oh, I think I got more things. Uh, Marissa Black um, also shared, um, oh, I think she just put, she linked the article that Kay mentioned. Okay, cool. Um, just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for coming to my talk this morning. Um, you may or may not have a lot, have had a lot of talks on this topic before. It's been a really important one for me to continue growing in. So thank you for the opportunity to have the talk with you all. Um, yeah. I guess if there's no other questions or comments, I know some of us have patients to see or another meeting to get to, all the Jerry uh, faculty folks and fellows. So I guess I'll see you all there if you are. Thank you.